Welcome to a Wednesday edition of the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Ian Flynn, the Bumble King, and joining me as always is my Bumble co-host, Kyle, JCRB Krause. We are winning on this fine Wednesday. Hello, Ian. What's up? Hello, Kyle. Wait, are we getting are we getting W's all over this place? I, I mean, I, I I guess I don't know. What am I What am I even saying? Help me. Well, if we are, hopefully they can scrub out easily because this place is just a pit. Honestly, it, W's everywhere. It's true. Too many. Too many W's. Huh. Time to make some L's. <laughs> <laughs> We also have too many questions from our patrons over at patreon.com slash bumblecast, ko-fi.com slash bumblecast, and our YouTube members. So to fix that, we're just going to have to answer them. I guess we will. Or we could just not. But no, we we will. No, because no, if let, we, Let's do it. Yeah, yeah I, guess we, I guess we should. We've, we've made the commitment, so uh, I guess we'll we've just... We've already restarted the recording. We've already started the recording, so let's, let's do. All right, I guess. Fine. Not like we got anything else to talk about. We'll just sit here in silence for an hour and be like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question from Miles the Prower. In a previous Bumblecast, someone asked what would happen if Scourge was pulled into the story of King Arthur instead of Sonic. I was wondering what you think would happen if Scourge was pulled into the story of the Arabian Nights. How would the story of Secret Rings change with Scourge being the quote unquote hero of the book? I don't think it would change that much at all, really. Shah Shah would bring him in to combat Eraser. I think that's how it went. It's been a long time. Point is, he's in the book, and Eraser would see a threat, shoot him with the arrow, and Scourge would take that very personally, (laughs) and then proceed to tear through the book in a revenge quest. It's not so much to save the book, it's just to kick Eraser's ass, and Shah would tag along. And even the Dark Spine Sonic transformation, he pulls upon some of the really negative world rings. It would still work for Scourge. Dark Spine Scourge would probably be pretty sick looking, and he would be even more merciless with the lamp there at the end. Like, instead of just wishing a razor into the lamp again, he'd probably say, All right, and for my final wish, eat your own foot and keep chowing down to there's nothing left. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, nice. Here's a question from Mobius. Just like with Julie Sue and Laura Lee, how would Knuckles react to the Brotherhood of Guardians being transported to Angel Island, either in Mainline or in IDW? How would Knuckles' relationship with them be like, and how would he feel about Locke? Uh, Mainline and IDW, uh, Knuckles are the same thing. So he would be initially you know, kind of suspicious of why there's suddenly more kidness, but you know, thankful. That he's not alone anymore. But I think that would wear out its welcome real fast. I mean, we're it's kind of a question of which incarnation of Locke are we talking like pre or post disaster? If we're talking pre disaster and he's still uh, untested in where he stands on his morals and his worldview and thinks he's calling the shots and can direct things and the brotherhood's like yeah no we should totally be monitoring everything knuckles is gonna be like no you you come to my island tell me how to do my job and my home get out of here i i think it would become very friction filled very fast um and is tobor even part like not tobor tobor fake to ah god moratory rex is he still amongst the group in this scenario because I could see him, you know, getting a lay of the land real quick and going, you know, Knuckles, they're all kind of jerks. We should kick them off the island. And uh, while you do that, I'll watch the Master Emerald. (laughs) (laughs) Sure, seems legit. And Spectre being like the only one of remotely reasonable common sense would be like, okay, we're on a different planet, different reality. Maybe we should rein it in a little bit. And Locke's like, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. And he sets up cameras everywhere. <laughs> That's you got him and, weird or you got him and Knuckles all. basically in this perfect orbit around the island. Locke putting up cameras and Knuckles falling behind him, just taking them down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Knuckles wouldn't stand for that shit. And we got a question from Noni. Okay, seeing how Infinite got absorbed by the Phantom Ruby after using it for an extended amount of time... What's the maximum percentage amount of Phantom Ruby energy you can be saturated with 
before it finds dissolving you as a solution. No, that's a fan an explanation for what happened, but that's not what happened as far as we know. Uh, it makes enough sense given what's presented in the game, but nobody knows what freaking happened to Infinite there at the end. If that is the scenario, then, I mean, Infinite kind of went whole hog with his Phantom Ruby powers. Like, he had giant monster infinites and uh, multiple weapons and minions summoned. If I guess it's if he just abused the power nonstop, it's an issue. <laughs> All right, here's a question from Pedanticat. Scenario crossover time. Beerus and Wiz have ended up in the modern <laughs> Sonic universe. Time out. What? Did Back I say up. that wrong? It's Whis. You know what? That's Whiz. Okay, fine. <laughs> it what, is is, what is Beerus and Whiz? Whis. Beerus and Whis are A Dragon Ball uh, characters. Okay. Dragon Ball characters. Okay. Uh, They're gonna, beer and wine. I'm gonna in Japanese. I'm gonna whiz all over this question. <laughs> it shows what I know. <laughs> Beerus and Whis have ended up in the modern Sonic universe. How do their interactions with the Sonic cast play out? Are their taste buds blown away when Sonic introduces them to chili dogs? And what does Beerus make of this universal god of destruction? Not chaos, but the true god of destruction, Big the Cat. And plot twist, Froggy is actually Big's angel. Yeah, that tracks. So here's the issue. Nobody, nobody in the Sonic cast is approaching Goku's level as he was in Battle of Gods. I'm not even talking like the Super Saiyan God transformation there at the end. I mean, not even base level Goku. So nobody is going to get Beerus's attention the way Goku did. Now, Sonic is certainly impressive in his own right, so maybe that's a novelty to Beerus, but Sonic's going to have to work a lot harder to impress him, and it's probably going to be more of the food that saves that planet more than anything else. And it might be Whis who has to kind of nudge things in that direction. Like Beerus is looking around like, I'm tired of this place. Whis, I'm going to blow it up. Actually, I've heard that there's quite a number of delicacies here. Sonic, why don't you show him a chili dog? And we go from there. You know, mint candy, your Sundays, Eggman's giant photo re- photorealistic hoagies. There, there's a lot of scrumptious things in Sonic's world to tide Beerus over. And like- then when he finds... Hmm? Was that Orpot's voice? Or Starline's voice? They're pretty close. They're pretty close. <laughs> what do you want from me? Range? Yes. Um, <laughs> too bad. Oh, okay. And then when he finds out that, you know, Big is present, it's like, oh, Lord Big, I didn't realize I was trespassing on your territory. It's all right. I'm vacationing here for the next 3,000 millennia. I enjoy the fish. <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone else just turns and looks at Big. (laughs) It's like, what? You never asked. (laughs) Hey, big guy. Hey, little guy. Did you tell me that? You're gone. (laughs) Uh, Oh, man. He is. He truly is. Well and truly. He should be, at least. All right, we got one from Quaggle Gaggle. You've mentioned going out of your way to not look at fan works, but how do you handle slash deal with stuff outside the Sonic bubble that's hard to ignore? For reference, I'm talking about outside references like OK KO having the crossover with Sonic or The Simpsons making a weird joke. And yes, that includes Uganda Knuckles, Egg Mam, and now Sonic and Friends walking into stores. You've shown yourself not above sneaking in snooping as usual. But I am curious if either of you have takes other than I like it or don't like or deeply confused and weirded out by it. It's one thing to be a fan looking in, but having been involved as you've both been, I'd love to know your impressions. If Aaron could, I'd love you too. Okay. I don't think we can don't... bring Aaron Weber in on some random question, unfortunately. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know where um... I don't know what that guy's up to. And also I have nothing to do with Sonic. Why are you why are you asking me? <laughs> I've not hey. been involved with anything Sonic. Don't I don't let me in with this guy. I, I'm don't blame me. deep into Sonic, and you're in my orbit. You can't escape. You're don't, part of this. Don't now. blame me. I mean, part yeah, of the ship, part of the I, crew, part yeah, of the but, ship, part of the crew. 
Yeah, yes, but I I mean I haven't officially done anything. Like I've not been like involved in anything Sonic That's related. True. That's true. Like I'm not credited That's on anything and I I haven't done any uncredited work on anything related to Sonic. That's true. So it's more of a contact high, I guess. I yeah, <laughs> something like that. I, I I get I get occasional whiffs of your Sonic farts occasionally. That's about <laughs> it. That's all I get. So <laughs> Stuff like the OKKO OK crossover and references in popular media like The Simpsons is not fan content. Well, OKKO OK really blurs that line because Ian is a huge fan of the series and this was a love letter to the franchise. Not saying that's not it, but those are like licensed or lampoons. Those are not fan content in the traditional sense. And stuff like Uganda Knuckles or the YouTube poops like snooping as usual enter such a cultural zeitgeist that you can't escape it. They kind of transcend fan content into just general popular memes. Like folks who don't know anything about Sonic knew about Uganda Knuckles because it was just a weird little thing. <laughs> so that's that's kind of a different thing entirely. The fan content I'm trying to avoid is stuff where fans theory craft how to fix potholes in the narrative of the games, or they create characters that they weave into the IDW continuity, or they create characters that are very much within the style brand so that they really feel like they fit. That kind of stuff I avoid because it feels too easy to appropriate it unintentionally. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Like I don't want to accidentally slight a individual fan. I'm not afraid of stepping on the Simpsons toes for making a Sonic reference. You know, they're, they're worlds apart. Well, maybe you should be, I don't know. Do you want to get sued by Disney for making a reference to their reference? I don't know, man. Oh, yeah, they're Disney now. Jeez. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> I'm going to consume all worlds, haha. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, Disney. Consuming more than, uh, dang it. Now I can't freaking, the planet consuming Transformer. Damn it. It's not Galvatron. Unicron, thank you. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, Aladdin was better on the Genesis. Might as well get Sega too, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> Gotta acquire fast. Uh, Gorsh, where's that damn chaos emerald? <laughs> <laughs> Duck noises, said Starline. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <sighs> Well, I guess we'll just move on to more questions until we are acquired by the Walt Disney Company. <laughs> Here's one from Scruffy Matt. So, um, how exactly did Eggman's face ship work? In some scenes, we saw it flying upright with the face pointed outwards, sideways, the way the Death Egg does. When it was distributing the metal virus from this angle, the virus appears to be dribbling out of the ship's mouth. However, in some scenes, we also saw the face ship tilted downwards, appearing to projectile vomit the metal virus onto its victims. Am I misinterpreting the art, or did the ship sometimes tilt 90 degrees? Surely that must have made things awkward for the crew, and what would stop the vats of metal virus from spilling over? Is there zone cop technology at play here? Everything is on gyroscopes. That's what I was going to say. Like, everything on the inside is always upright, no matter which way the actual ship is facing. Yeah. Like, like, like have you seen stoves on ships or, like, pool tables on cruise ships? Yeah. And they're set up on those, like, really fascinating gyroscopic uh, auto balancers? Yeah. Yeah. That's the entire interior of the face ship. It's pretty badass. I like it. Here's a question from Scurvy Pirate Dog. After looking into things a while ago, I discovered that, with Sonic Movie 3, there's still a big chance that Jim Carrey could return as Robotnik despite his announcements. The producers and writer are confident he'll return, and Jim Carrey has also shared ideas on what he would like to do with Robotnik in Movie 3. Hint, it includes a fat suit. 
Reason I bring this up is because I'm curious. If Jim Carrey does return to movie three, what would you see them do with the character? Personally, I would love it if they did the fat suit to complete the Eggman look, as well as having him create Metal Sonic as his final act to counter Sonic and Shadow. But what about you? Would you want to see him come closer to his video game counterpart, or would you rather want to see them take the character in a completely different direction? I I don't know, honestly, because I feel like between movie one and two, he made the full transition from proto Eggman to just straight up Eggman. Yeah, he, he had the menace. He had the cruelty. He had the bombastic showmanship. He, he was Eggman. Like he had completed the transformation. I'm very satisfied with his Eggman. And I don't think the fat suit's really necessary, to be honest. It's more the bald and the mustache look. Yeah. Um, and having fallen into a giant burning inferno of destroyed machine parts, spoiler, I don't really see how the fat suit would come into play. And there are some sensitivity issues to be had with fat suits in general. Look at the discourse surrounding Thor in Endgame. Yep. So if he went fat suit to be more authentic, I honestly would hope it would skew closer to the Sonic 06 look than the game look, because the game look is not remotely human <laughs> in proportion when you get down to it. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's necessary. I think what comes down to it is the overall feel and the way that they rendered the coat and the goggles and the mustache. That all felt Eggman to me. I was that. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Uh, With Shadow showing up in movie three, let's be honest here. Shadow is the only character with like a serious backstory. Yeah. Like you can sum everybody else up in a sentence. He needs a paragraph or two. And that's enough driving narrative for a movie. So if Jim were to come back for Jim, like we're good friends. If Mr. Carey were to come back for movie three, I feel like he ought to play more of a supporting role to Shadow, and Shadow should be the star antagonist, to be honest. If they pull from the Gerald material, maybe there's something to explore there uh, you know, with this incarnation of Eggman learning that he did have family, considering that he called himself an orphan in the first film. You know, How does he deal with that? What is Gerald, like game Gerald, in that he was a good man who fell from grace or... Are they going to put a new spin on it? And in that context, you know, maybe Carrie's Eggman could f- see some new character direction. Maybe he doubles down on the evil scientist shtick. Maybe he decides to reform. There, there could be a small character moment with him. But if he were to come back, and I know I'm saying this about Jim freaking Carrie, I feel like he should come in second to Shadow. This should be Shadow's movie because. <laughs> If you're going to do his character justice, he needs to take the forefront. I'm really worried about how they're going to do Shadow and Sonic and Knuckles and Tails the same amount of justice. And then you add in Jim Carrey, who's going to have a fair amount of screen time. And if they do another human subplot, then (laughs) there's a lot lot of ingredients to be added to the stew pot here. So Mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and there's the whole thing about possibly Amy maybe finally getting introduced, which would be nice. It would, so, but again, but I worry it's too much. It would then, be hard, I know. Like, in Sonic 2, and let me just specify this before somebody throws me under the bus for, oh, yeah, it doesn't want Amy in the movies. I do. She She deserves to be in the films. But in Sonic 2, Tails' backstory got... Like the super abridged version. Tails, yeah, Tails kind of got the shaft in the second movie. He got like written out for a yeah, lot he's of act out two. Of the entire second act. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's and he's just gone, and then it's like, oh, come on, because you had to reintroduce <laughs> Eggman, you had to reintroduce his relationship with Stone, you had to introduce Knuckles in his entirety. You had to introduce Tails in his entirety. You had to move Sonic's story along with his family, with Tom and Maddie. That's like seven character interactions right there. And then they had more subplots because they introduced Gun on top of it all. Yeah. And something had to give, and what gave was Tails. So if we have Shadow, who is even more complicated than all of that, if Amy were to be introduced, she would probably get very little time to shine on her own. Uh Uh-huh. 
And if Amy were to show up, I feel like she needs to have a proper introduction. She needs to be utilized fully and properly, not just thrown in there to take a name off the list, you know? Not for not for just fan service. Yeah. But uh, it's a bit of a sausage fest. <laughs> Otherwise, it's like, uh, come on, I, I I don't know what I don't know how to I I don't know how to uh, reconcile that. So I, I I hope maybe they can figure something out, and, and I don't know, maybe just throw out the human subplot, like make Gerald the human subplot in some way, I guess, or the flashbacks with Maria. Don't just yeah, I I don't know. Just thoughts. Just thoughts I have. <sighs> Here's a question from Knights Ubel. Somehow the two of you won two sets of tickets from two separate giveaways. One of them is Crush 40 playing every Sonic lyrical piece, including things like Fastest Thing Alive and things akin to that. The other, somehow, all floor Beatles, alive and well, are performing their greatest hits. But you can only go to one as they take place at the same time. Which do you go to? I'd personally pick Crush 40, which would probably give some a heart attack. No, I'll, I'll see you there at the Crush 40 concert. Save me a seat. Yep, me too. Not even not even a second thought. No. <laughs> nope. Nope. I mean, sure, I enjoy stuff by the Beatles. Sure. And, you know, in this magical incarnation where they're, you know, all in their prime and performing their best. I'm sure it'd be great. But. It's Crush 40. Know, it, it's Crush 40. Yeah. And. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the. the the Beatles are all right, but uh, I, I mean, I'm yeah. No, I'm going to Crush Forty because uh, I've I've not been to a Crush Forty show and I want to go. I've not been to a Beatles show, but I really don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, if they're not in their prime and they have their audience that they had in their prime, the crowds, because uh, apparently you couldn't even hear them, <laughs> the band over the people. <laughs> it's like hmm. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, at the Crush 40 concert, everyone's going to be singing along anyway, so you're going to hear the song no matter what. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's... Yeah. I mean, if you're a fan of the Beatles and you want to go to the Beatles show over Crush 40, more power to you. But uh, I'm going to Crush 40. So, yeah. You have fun. We can sell them Beatles tickets for a lot. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> It'll it'll fund our uh, our ability to follow Crush Forty on tour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, with that, I think it's time to take a break, and we'll be back with more on the Bumblecast. <laughs> We're back, and uh, it's time. To get into more questions, here's one from Sequoia. Are either of you a fan of the McElroy brothers or their work? If so, any favorite podcasts or other creative project of theirs that you enjoy? With Night the Owl paying homage to Clint McElroy and the McElroys writing a story for the 30th anniversary special, they've made a small mark on the comics, and I couldn't help but wonder if you were familiar with any other work they've done. If not, I definitely recommend listening to the first season of their podcast, The Adventure Zone, or checking out the graphic novelization of it when you have a chance. I have not, and that is on the list of things that I apparently need to get to. <laughs> yeah. <That> ever expanding, <laughs> winding list. <laughs> I am familiar with the McElroy brothers, but uh, I've never really delved too much into their work. Um, uh, yeah, I've not listened to them too much. So, I, I mean, I, I know how to pronounce McElroy. Is, does that count? Yeah, because I would have read it McElroy. McElroy? Yeah, I know. That's what, how a lot of people would have read it. It's it's supposed to be McElroy. <laughs> so, yeah. That's just, sorry, I haven't listened to it yet, but hey, maybe one day I'll get into it. I, I ended up d diving deep into Critical Role, so Adventure Zone is on my radar, though, because I quite enjoy Critical Role, and so sounds like Adventure Zone would be some similar fun. All right, here's one from Sonic, Sonic, Sonic. If Chaos Control is a black arms technique, how can Sonic and Silver use it? Can they still use it? Good question. I don't know. Sonic seems to just have this ability to learn new techniques on the fly and just instantly be good at them. That just seems to be his thing. Uh, Silver, if you want to buy into the 
theory that silver is somehow shadow's descendant. Maybe that's an explanation, but that is a whole other kettle of fish that I do not care to take the lid off of. Oh boy. Yeah. Don't do that. Keep that lid on there. I don't want to smell it. Here's a question from Speedweed. So I've been hearing a lot about Dark Mobius, and while I haven't read Archie Sonic to that point, I am now invested enough to ask this question. So, a phase on rock hits Sonic's planet, and as a result, that rock makes a whole new dimension. A Dark Aether equivalent to the world we know and love. What would be different about this Dark World compared to Dark Aether? Would the Ing make a comeback? And if so... What cool-looking Darkling designs would you imagine? Best of all, knowing Eggman, how would he potentially weaponize the Needle Mouse equivalent of a toxic alternate dimension? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been so long since I went through Metroid Prime 2. Now, clearly, we don't want to just do a rehash of Anti-Mobius. That's, that'd be boring. That's too easy. Mm -hmm. um, that and Dark Aether had its own very specific feel to it. It was a direct corruption of light aether so i would imagine the ing would show up because they were born of the dark aether was it a phase on rock or yeah you said a phase on rock okay. just say, yeah it's, it's phase on so i would imagine the ing are there and the ing themselves kind of take on the traits of those that they possess and interact with they steal samus's suit pieces and become the bosses so I'm just imagining a slew of badniks that are now just like actually terrifying to look at, like moto bugs with a single glowing cyclopean eye and gigantic sickle arms and buzz bombers that look like they could actually hurt you instead of that big doofy googly eyed look. <laughs> and then, you know, you manage to bust them open and the little animals inside are not cute. You don't want to rescue them. You want to put them back inside the robot. Get back in there. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you thought like they were. You happy... thought the robots were angry. No, the little <laughs> animals inside are even more angry. <laughs> <laughs> like the sunflowers are actually saw blades that will reach out and try to cut you down. Oh no, that's terrible. Uh, I love it. <laughs> and overall, I imagine to be kind of like in Sonic CD, where you have your dark future or bad future options. Yeah, where the terrain is spiky and somewhat remixed so that it is not to your advantage and all polluted and gross and yeah yeah i like yeah. it i like it so of course eggman would be sending scouts into the portals he would be doing his absolute darndest to either conquer this dark mobius or siphon energy off it and turn it into a concentrated dark beam <laughs> which <laughs> we do almost mario sunshine style paint the light world with the dark corrupted version. We don't need Eggman with phase on beams. That sounds bad. <laughs> like that's going to stop him. <sighs> and uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can finally get your dark supersonic or dark sonic transformation. Legit. Yeah. Tool around enough in dark Mobius. Dark spine. Hmm. Finally, we have dark sonic. Name is shadow. I don't know what people are so freaking up in arms about. Oh, no, Sonic's been corrupted by the dark side. No, that's just Shadow. Oh, no, Shadow's been corrupted. Wait, he looks the exact same. Yeah, nothing's changed. Oh. Okay. Yeah, he's the same. Nothing's different. <laughs> <laughs> he's acting the same, too. Nothing's different. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Weird. <laughs> All right, here's a question from Steph Cube. I hope Whisper expands her circle of friends. I think Cream and Sonic could also be good friends with her. How do you imagine those dynamics? Would she have tea with Cream and her mother? Would she and Sonic be coordinated in battle and maybe eat some chili dogs on the way home? She's friends with Sonic. It's just Sonic understands that she doesn't like to pal around as much as his other friends. Like everyone else, you know, let's go on an adventure. Let's hang out. Let's have loud, happy, boisterous times and whisper not so much. She likes her private time. She likes time away. And he respects that, and he gives her space. That's one thing I like about this um, Sonic is like he's like very empathetic. He, he is like mm -hmm. surprisingly understanding about you know letting people be who they need to be without you know forcing them to do anything that they well, don't want to the do. Is, like Sonic is supposed to be cool. That's right. like one of his key defining traits. But and what cool is has changed a lot from the nineties. Yes. So. 
in this day and age, cool is someone who is, you know, witty and powerful and strong, but also uh, compassionate and caring without necessarily being all sobby about it. You know, right. He doesn't have to be, he's not going to be gentle about things, you know, but he will be respectful and aware of it. Um, and I, I, I kind of assume that whisper knows that within that circle of friends, she's in a safe place. So she wouldn't necessarily seek out the companionship, but if cream ran over with a crumpet and asked her for tea, she would have a hard time saying no. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. wouldn't necessarily be comfortable sitting out in the garden with no cover and so many obvious sniper points <laughs> and distraction by the absolutely delicious biscuits. Vanilla, how do you make these? I'm getting distracted. <laughs> yeah, I like it. She's letting her guard down once in a while and it freaks her out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe she eventually learns to adjust. Maybe. <sighs> Whisper so good. Here's one from the Might of Gabura. Being an eternal god of time and seeing what he's done and was going to do according to the game and Prima Guide, could Solaris destroy the concept of space time? Yes. I thought that's what he did. Or am I yep. not remembering that? That's what I remember. Okay. That was the threat that he was going to destroy all space time. I've not actually played 06. That's okay. So, but uh, I've seen enough of it. I take that back. I have played it because, you know, they put it up digitally for five bucks recently. I'm like, you know what? Fine. (laughs) They put it back up. Fine. I'll do it for five freaking dollars digitally. I'll grab it. And then I started playing. I'm like, oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. I knew the controls and the physics were really janky and really bad. But uh, you, you... if you have not tried it yourself, you may not quite understand. They're bad. <laughs> really bad. Oof. One of the first things I did was get caught in one of the buildings inside of it. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, Sonic 06. Here's one from Tempo. What all do you know about the Mario Archie comic pitch? Did it get any farther than the art posted online? If there were any story plans, do you know what they were? And if so, can you share them? What kind of Super Mario story would the both of you come up with? I wrote it. What? No. I, I, I wrote the pitch. No, you didn't. Don't lie to me. And you did. I... <laughs> what was and a few years ago? I just basically tweeted out the summation of it because right. I was pretty confident it's dead. It wasn't so going to happen. You didn't get to see that chain. Uh, Cliff Notes version is the pitch was for a four part mini series, and the general mindset of the times to more or less approach it the way we did with Sonic, which was game adaptations with uh, additional content to string things together. And the hope was that the first mini would turn into an ongoing, and then we'd just kind of go through the library of Mario games and try to weave a narrative thread throughout. Um, the premise was that Mario and Luigi were small time plumbers who were hired to fix the plumbing in the castle. And Luigi was all excited because, oh boy, this job's going to set us for life. And Mario was like, yeah, I guess, but gosh, I want something more exciting in life. And they <laughs> arrived right after Bowser had kidnapped Peach. So they gather up what's left of the power ups in the castle's arsenal or stock room or whatever and embark on a truncated journey through the various worlds and mario is all eager because you know adventure excitement mm-hmm. battling an enemy army this is just the call to adventure that he wanted and luigi is just like no 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 bad 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 and they have no experience being heroes so they burn through all the power up super quick and as they're approaching bowser's castle luigi's like no th- we're done i'm done i'm out this is too much we are not heroes we are not warriors we are plumbers this is bigger than us and mario's like we come this far people are counting on us we have to do this so they go their separate ways and mario goes through the castle on his own he reaches bowser who's all like okay so you're the one who's been causing so much trouble i've heard about you let's tussle and they're fighting on the bridge over the molten moat and you know mario is holding his own but he's just not strong enough to break through bowser's hide and right in the middle of this big dramatic showdown between the two, you hear this. 
that and it's luigi <laughs> in an absolute panic just sprinting through the castle trying to catch up with mario and he runs right past him face plants into the opposite wall which knocks the decorative axe off the wall which hits the bridge which chops it down bowser falls in mario jumps off his head to safety and luigi's like i couldn't leave you behind but i am absolutely terrified and mario's like it doesn't matter you're here that's what counts they rescue peach they go back to the castle they're made the official royal plumbers they're set for life and luigi's like okay finally that's all behind us we're good and mario's like yeah but i wouldn't mind if we maybe did that like again and you see bowser coming out of the fiery moat going okay we're this isn't over (laughs) uh i figured it was gonna end with mario falling asleep and then no that would be how like the second one would have started because we would have been Wart and all that for the second arc and yeah uh at the time it hadn't been confirmed that mario 3 was all a stage play and the whole concept of mario being kind of whimsical hadn't hadn't quite permeated as much so how that would have factored in i don't know there was also some rumblings Take this with a grain of salt, because I've gotten all this like second, third, fourth hand that the way Nintendo treats Mario as a property is very uh, compartmentalized. So we probably wouldn't have been able to touch classic Mario and would have been more like just Mario Galaxy themed stories without access to the rest of the Mario universe. So no Donkey Kong, no pre-galaxy probably no post-galaxy no cart it would have been just that particular flavor of mario which would have been (laughs) stuck in whatever the latest marketing thing would have been at the time and not yeah not the impression i the impression i got and i could be very wrong sonic is kind of like that too but it's i feel like Sega's a little more lenient. Way, 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 way more lenient. Like, sure, classic is its own kind of thing, and there's a bit of divide. Yeah. But that's a lot broader than, like, saying Mario Galaxy is this brand of Mario. You can't touch paper. You can't touch Mario and Luigi. You can't touch RPG. You can't touch, you know, anything Donkey Kong related. Yoshi doesn't count because all the Yoshi Island stuff is its own thing or blah, 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 blah. Like, would you even be able to like touch sunshine and 64 no, or anything? No. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's the impression I got. Is so that, you know, main, mainline Mario games off the table, except for the latest one. <laughs> but that, that's the impression At I got. The is time, that wow. There is no, there is Nintendo doesn't look at it as mainline Mario. It looks at it like, yeah 3d mario and classic style mario and mario versus donkey kong which might be separate from classic donkey kong which is definitely separate from donkey kong country yeah like, there's nothing ugh. connecting anything ugh. that's that's kind of how it seems like like sonic i mean the connecting threads are minimal sometimes but at least it feels like there is some kind of at least bare bones continuity mm-hmm. mario doesn't really have that <laughs> And see, that would be fine for a Mario book if it was just like this celebration of the franchise. Right. You know, you could do a race arc. You could do a sports arc. Mm-hmm. You could do a serious adventure arc, but you would need access to the entire library to really have fun and flesh it out. Yeah. And the impression I got is that it would be very, very restrictive. So yeah, I'm not super heartbroken that it didn't see the light of day. Yeah, it's just, Nintendo doesn't really seem to have much interest in making Mario a narrative-driven series franchise too much. I mean, they yeah, have, they have. I understand, but yeah, they have the spin some spinoffs that are more narratively focused, like Mario and Luigi and Paper Mario and stuff. But in terms of just the overall overarching thing of Mario, mm-hmm. it's not really meant for that and it doesn't have to be it's it's a valid approach it's fine i like i kind of like that it's just you know here's mario in a fun adventure have fun with mario that's okay i'm good with that but you know i think a comic would need something with a little bit more meat on its bones to really (laughs) to to last 
<laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have gameplay to engage you for extended for extended periods of time. Right. We have art and we have narrative. Yeah. And the art would have been great because Tracy, you know, is an absolute beast, but Oh yeah. The art's beautiful. Uh, it looks outstanding. Like I would have absolutely loved this look of this book. It looks just the art that's been shared looks amazing. So Oh, what could have been? Oh well. Oh, we didn't answer the second. What kind of Super Mario story would both of you come up with? Uh, well, you already did. <laughs> I mean, I guess. I guess. Well, I mean, you're just retelling the first game story. To be fair. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was the initial pitch because it worked for Sonic and it worked for Mega Man. But yeah. if the opportunity were to come again, I don't think I'd want to go that route. I mm-hmm. I think trying to in trying to build on the Mario continuity is too structured for such a whimsical series. I think it would be better suited for more fanciful, uh, open adventures. It it puts some interconnectivity to it so that there's a reason to go back and read stuff that you missed and, you know, a sense of building and going somewhere. Right. But not focus so hard on doing something structural and intentionally narratively building Mm -hmm. do something that is more celebratory of the fun and the wacky that is mario (laughs) i mean i just say do a super mario brothers super show adaptation (laughs) whatever that's goofy enough that's lots of elements of mario 2 in there sure i'm down and we got a question here from x I understand Sonic is not supposed to be a killer. I have no qualms with that. In fact, it's a factor of his character I adore. However, in IDW, it is established that there are maximum security prisons within the world. So why wouldn't Sonic try to at least throw Eggman in jail? The only thing I can think of is that he would be opposed to jails as it clashes with his love for freedom. But surely he could also rationalize that they could still keep large threats from harming innocents without necessarily having to kill them. It is a matter of freedom. Yep. And his mentality is... You know, okay, I stopped him, and if he causes trouble again, I'll stop him again. If he doesn't, good. Is it airtight reasoning? No. (laughs) Is it the best option? Probably not. Does he have to be flawless in his rationalization? No. He can be wrong. He can be flawed. It's okay. Yeah, you can disagree with Sonic. It's fine. And finally, our last question this episode comes to us from The Cartoonist question to you both what are some of your favorite memes like they can be as stupid as you want i get the feeling kyle still has a can of beans ready and waiting for the re-release of morbius come on round three or as abstract as hell like the shocked pikachu face i gotta say that when um zero wing came to whatever the virtual console is being called these days did the nintendo switch online service yeah yeah that that doesn't have quite the same I know as it's a virtual an, console. It sucks. It's not a good name, but yeah. But when Zero Wing was announced and like all of the memes came flooding back and then the entire release trailer was the meme. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, this takes me back. <laughs> this, this is a vintage meme. It is aged well. Mm, yes. Uh I'm I'm so glad that Zero Wing is finally getting its due. And <laughs> You know, being exposed to more than just n- nerds who are just on the internet way too much. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm I'm still a fan of dramatic chipmunk. <laughs> mm-hmm. So stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I do love me a good Rick roll. It helps that I actually enjoy the song. So <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy how it's become more creative over time. Yeah. That people have gotten so used to it that it's less the Rickroll and more of the presentation of it. Right. Exactly. How you do it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm old. So I guess all the memes I like are old. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the meme of uh principal skinner and the uh, steamed hams (laughs) steamed hams yes (laughs) the the breadth and the variety that the sheer creative force that that that's so ridiculous impressive (laughs) yeah i also like how like if you're not familiar with uh with the cheetah men 
how they became a meme and their theme song became mm-hmm. sort of a, a, a meme for a hot second. It was very funny using that song in very uh, creative ways and, of course, getting remixed a whole heck of a lot. Just things like that. And the one where uh, Kermit is taking a sip of his tea and mm-hmm. there's a biting commentary in there. <laughs> Never mind that I'm a fan of the Muppets. Never mind that that tea looks really good. But every time it comes across, I'm like, ooh, I hope that's ice cold tea because that burns. <laughs> or like a, <laughs> a, another Kermit classic is the the one where he's looking at himself in a dark uh, cloak. <laughs> <laughs> do it do it yes i mean that's a good one right there just emperor palpatine saying do it (laughs) that's a classic (laughs) uh legendary and i i haven't really devoted my memory to some but this is the kind of thing where if it pops up again it's like oh yeah i remember that but it's not something that i kind of consciously chronicle oh right the other skinner meme the out of the am i out of touch meme Oh, yeah, that one seems to be getting a lot of mileage lately. (laughs) I may or may not have uh, taken advantage of that one myself at some point. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, well, well, yeah, I mean, there's (laughs) just so many good ones. Lots of terrible ones, too. Oh, sure. And I don't know if this really counts, and I wouldn't call it my favorite, but it does tickle me a bit that hashtag knowing smile seems to have escaped my grasp it is it has grown a life all its own at this point yeah <laughs> yeah that happens sometimes i i get a special hearty chuckle when i see other idw creators who have fun stuff lined up and they trot it out and it's like ah you see <laughs> you see the power no. of the hashtag knowing smile now it has become the company line <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be IDW's motto going forward. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I mean, that's just classic Sonic ones, of course. Snooping as usual, I see. And uh, no, no copyright law in the universe is going to stop me. <laughs> God, the timing of that. Which I know. <laughs> It's like, wow, this is very on point. Wow. <laughs> Pure serendipity, given how things are timed in production. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's right at that moment, it's like, oh, no, wow. Uh, did you guys plan this? <laughs> uh, yeah. Got any more, or is that good enough? I'm tapped out. I'm sure there's more. Yeah, but... there's plenty more that we live. The shocked Pikachu face is also very funny. Oh sure, yeah, I like how I like the uh, the fan art of Eggman making that same face, <laughs> and uh, find the computer room. That's a classic, along with that damn fourth Chaos Emerald. <laughs> Great stuff. All right, that's gonna do it for this episode of the Bumblecast. But before we go, we need to give a big thank you to everyone who helps make this show possible. Via their patronage over at patreon.com slash bumblecast, ko-fi.com slash bumblecast, and our YouTube members. Big thank you to Daniel H., Alex P., James K., John B., Jennifer R., Robotnik Holmes, Samuel P., Sam Cybercat, Mike B., Dave M., Coupling Crew 128, Duas Dizdin, Andrew D., Salute Your Cat, Jay Frost, Hero of Light 13, Scruffy Ooh. Matt, Chris A., Ryan D., Sony, John M., Noni, Jib, Don B., Yami M., Lee H.K., Lisa M., Fiona M., Chevelle, Invade Turbo Tunis, Ben Wolfsbane, Blue Title Gamer, Tick Tick, Keeper of Monsters, Xanderoni the Painter, Axis, Final Neil, Jonathan D., Scurvy Pirate Hog, Nimmer, Solaris Stain, The Name is X, God Godzilla, Daddler the Dalek, Chaos Universe, Sonic Legacy, Daniel B, Ava Arctic, Pedanti Cat, Dove, Red the Supernamic, Quaggle Gaggle, Chad, Professor Rye, Cameron H, Jennifer H, Arc Fighter, Les Nondal, Sapphire Skeleton, Jack the Animator, Preston M, Alphamon or Yukon, Noah S, Kojiro Highwind, Alex GS, Super Sonic Fan, Awesome Cakester, Radry, Chase the L, Finest Cacophony, Red Wolf, Knights Ubel, Just a Mountain Soul, Callum Q, Jolene B, Joshua S, Omega Watt, Ty H, Maddie H, John the Real Waluigi, and Tails, Triplets Born, The Throne awaits kjb in zephyr de roosevelt owen bd dapper shinks 
the Marble Gardener, T Ranger, Four Sonic Fan, Lewis J, Lemur Chicken, Agent Kaz, Starlight Sec, Wild Forty Eight, Navari, Exodel, Michael P, Ty Cyan, Rhythm Raccoon, Doctor Meccano, Miles the Prower, Fenris Asker, Pap, Delta God Seventy Seven, Miggy Sawdust, Pig Dan Twenty, Jinx, Jamal S, Lacey M, Unlikely Veronica, Cosmic Cooking Hunter Seventy Seven, Oz Jam, Shimmy M, Angela V, Phi, Spiral Warrior, The Flower Garden, Sammy S, King Toasty, Tetsu Knife, Chaos Sonic One, Digimon, Mobius, Speedweed, Seth Cube, The Might of Gabora, Z Cartoonist, Zoom, Phelps G, Ryuko Shion, Meta Mode, Danny the Light, Frost the White Lion, Agnes S, and Wheels 282 Hedgehog. Amazing. All of those people are incredible. All those names you totally just read, Ian, right now. You didn't read them earlier and we're not reusing the recording. No, that didn't ha that doesn't happen. That's not what we're doing now. Pay no attention to that. Don't worry about that. It's perfectly authentic the first time. <laughs> It's authentic enough. Our our appreciation and thanks for them is still authentic, regardless of whether we read their name only once or three times. <laughs> hey, look, I get lightheaded if you do it too many times. I know, I know. It's a lot of names. I know. It used to be like 20. Now it's 100 million, or at least it might as well be 100 million. <laughs> Along that line, we're going to take a break, take a day or two off, and uh, we'll see you Friday for the standard Q&A edition of the Bumblecast. Until then... Be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and we'll see you then. See ya! The, <laughs> and throughout the week, the list of reading names becomes more and more exhausting <laughs> on each <laughs> so episode. Friday, it's just like... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sonor Card Gage. <laughs> Hello, Grantilda, would you like to share a miso shake? A miso shake? Mmm. The family might could. It's in your card gauge. You just kind of word salad it and make it creepy. <laughs> we had somewhere to be this morning. Mm -hmm. And we go to bed. And a project idea came to me and everything clicked. Oh, no. Design, character, plotting it's like if i don't write this down i'm never going to retain this because this is i think the final doc was like three pages uh -huh. like, everything is there so i got up and somewhere between four and five i went back to bed and it's <laughs> a very very rough starter document and it joins the pile of starter documents that i have amassed but it's like ah oh, i felt mm. good to just put it down on page Sounds like a Patreon post, if I've ever heard one. Maybe. I need to diversify, though, because I'm doing a lot of, here are these ideas that I haven't fully fleshed out. And it's like, they probably want something beyond my cliff notes. Ah, uh, they're just there to see what you do, man. I bet you could mm. put anything out, and they would like it. Flaming, Maybe. Flaming bag of dog poo? They would like it. <laughs> You've been listening to The Bumblecast, a co-production of Bumble King Comics and the KNGI Network. Original theme music composed by Ken Coda Snyder. Remixed intro by T-Lopes. Find out more information, along with podcast feeder links, MP3 downloads, and more at bumbleking.com and kngi.org. Stop it.